Uh, my name is Greg Varnum. I'll be doing the first presentation. I'm also your room moderator. Uh, I am not a lovely assistant. The sash keeps coming off me, so I apologize. But do know, even if it comes off, I'm not coming in and out of volunteer mode. I remain in volunteer mode the whole time. Um, so our first presentation, oops, I'm sorry. Our first presentation this morning, uh, to allow the other ones to keep on time and to keep us on schedule, I'm going to cut mine just a tiny bit short. Um, so if you're really, really hoping to talk about third-party wikis, uh, we'll probably have a meetup as well at some point. So it's a shock to people to learn uh, that there are actually media, there are wikis outside of the land of Wikimedia. I'm always surprised at the number of times, even at this conference, when you talk to people and they literally had no clue um, that the software can be used for other purposes. So there are, in fact, third-party wikis, and that's the term that we, within the developer and the media wiki software community, give to anyone who's running a wiki outside of Wikimedia. Um, they're generally used for community projects by corporations, nonprofits, social medias. Uh, so, for example, during the um, uh, Occupy movement, there was a temporary Occupy wiki that was created to help the different local Occupy movements stay in touch with each other and coordinate um, and just sort of use it as a mobile editing and a global edited uh, resource for that community. Um, nonprofits often use it both internally and externally, talking about the, oh, sorry. Uh, the common uses, I'll get back to that last slide in a second. Um, enterprise corporates, so companies will often use it both for managing resources for their employees and for outreach. So Mozilla, uh, as one example, uses it to do some tech support. DreamHost uses it. Another company, a web hosting company, um, uses it so that their users can provide support and record notes for one another. So a lot of kind of typical uses that exist with Wikipedia and with Wiktionary we can apply in other settings. Uh, another popular one is academic, so at universities and schools we see an increasing number of universities that are utilizing the MediaWiki software to uh, share all kinds of resources, put up uh, presentations from professors, and they also have internal ones that they use. Sometimes professors use them to post um, uh, their assignments, things like that, so they have an interesting online archive. Um, as I mentioned, the movement organizing and community organizing has kind of become an interesting new tool. Um, probably the largest one that we're always aware of is the knowledge sharing. So that is where uh, the uh, Wiki Voyage, Wiki Queer, the, the projects that are focused on specific issues that are, for whatever reason, maybe not covered within the umbrella um, of Wikipedia or one of the other Wikimedia wikis, but it's a lot of word wiki, um, wind up falling into that category. And how all this is possible is because the the platform or the software or the engine or the app or whatever term you're most familiar with and comfortable with that Wikimedia uses is open source. Uh, it's called MediaWiki. And that means that anyone in the world can download the software, run it on their server or their local computer, and have a wiki set up that looks very, very similar to the wikis we've all come to know and love under the Wikimedia community. Um, there are oftentimes a lot of complications. One of the biggest comments we get are, how can I make my wiki look just like Wikipedia? Uh, and we actually just recently kind of hashed into that. We found that there's about 30,000 pages um, that are necessary just to support the look and feel of Wikipedia. So the software is, is very advanced. It allows for a lot of uh, multi-integration. It's, it's pretty cool and sophisticated. Um, so if you've ever worked with templates, I'm sure everyone in the room, if you work at it, what winds up being interesting is every template winds up having five templates that support that. Each one of those templates have another five templates. So your average page can wind up using 90 templates sometimes uh, in so many different layers. And that's software is what enables us to do that. It is maintained by the Wikimedia movement. Um, so for folks who are not necessarily in the know, and I don't have time to go into the large lecture of, of Wikimedia branding. Um, but the basic idea is there's a difference between the Wikimedia Foundation and the Wikimedia movement itself. So all of us in this room are a part of the Wikimedia movement just by participating and editing that makes you a member of the movement. So the software is actually owned and produced by the movement. Um, there's an active room of about 400 developers that hang out in IRC on any given day that are constantly working on improvements. And we've really sped up that, oops, we've really sped up that rate. Um, so it's become a really, really wonderful resource outside of the Wikimedia community. The oversight for the software and what we call the, the code review, meaning that code that gets put into the actual MediaWiki software is still reviewed and maintained by the Wikimedia Foundation so that, uh, uh, let's say, a third party wiki that really, really wants to add something to core, that may still happen, but they're not going to be able to add it to core in a way that will then 
wipe out every one of the Wikimedia wikis. Um, so there is still some oversight and management. And to be honest, that's actually been a big relief uh, to third-party wikis because they trust the foundation to not break Wikipedia, which means it's most likely not going to break their wiki. Uh, in the next session, we're going to talk a little about extensions. And extensions are the add-ons to the software that allow it to do all of the really cool things that we've come to know it ability to do, like uh, compile books, um, create PDFs, uh, add citations more conveniently, expand templates, all that kind of stuff is managed by uh, uh, extensions. Some examples of some third-party wikis that exist out there. Um, this is just sort of a random sampling of, of ones that I'm personally familiar with. Uh, Wiki ed Educator it provides a, a resource hub for people working in both higher education and K through 12 education. Uh, a similar concept with Scholarpedia is for academic researchers to do information sharing and actually have original research, which is we all know is not permitted on Wikipedia. Uh, so that's how that winds up being a hub. Um, and then you get really cool sites like Wiki Voyage, which utilize the software in ways that we had never conceived of before, uh, to be honest. And it's always a really cool surprise to us the way that they're able to use open source maps and data to, uh, and Wiki Travel is very similar to this, to be able to document really neat things in different parts of the community all over the world. Uh, Conservapedia, I think, um, is kind of an infamous example. They offer their interpretations of Wikipedia articles. Um, and so their content is such that they have a very particular bias that they would like to promote. Um, and so that's the reason that they aren't hosted on Wikipedia. A similar concept with Wikiqueer, which is for the LGBT community, that has a pro-LGBT bias in their articles. Uh, so one example would be an article on Maggie Gallagher, who uh, works within the anti-LGBT industry. Her article on Wikipedia is probably going to be very neutral, sort of very factual based, whereas on Wikiqueer, Queer, they'll probably go a lot more into depth on her actual anti-LGBT actions, quotes from her, um, resource links, uh, things that generally we would not permit or want um, on Wikipedia. And then the wiki for wikis is Wiki Index, which actually uses the wiki model to record all the wikis in the world, have a page for them, and allow you to sort of navigate between them. So none of these are out there to, well, most of these aren't out there to directly try to compete with Wikipedia. Most of them uh, using really cool software like Transclusion, which is just a really geeky way of saying displaying dynamic content or displaying content live. We can actually use content between these wikis because they're all using the MediaWiki software. So on Wikiqueer and WikiEducator, for example, they will actually transclude or display live articles from Wikipedia. And when people go to click and edit, it then takes them to what we call the, you know, the host wiki, or in this case, Wikipedia, so they can actually engage in editing there. So there's a lot of really neat things that we can use MediaWiki to interconnect with people. Um, there's a really wonderful developer base. Like I said, there's usually about three to 400 people in the chat room at any given time. I think they're estimated, what, 2,000 developers now is sort of what it seems to be around? Guesstimate? Sure, fine, that sounds good. So there's about 2,000 developers, all well, mostly all volunteers. We do get a few people within corporate, um, like Wikia and Wikihow and places like that, where they are using it for very specific purposes, and then they have their own professional staff uh, who can develop it. And, and they wind up adding a lot of those extensions and developments back so that other wikis can wind up using them uh, in their experiences and their platforms. Um, the other uh, use that people have is for personal wikis. Uh, we, we're starting to see an increase of people, particularly in the recession, getting very clever with uh, wikis that are resumes or wikis that are uh, an archive of their family history or wikis um, that are an archive of their professional work or their academic work. So you can be really, really clever. Uh, we do run into some issues, though, where people often say, well, we want it to be like Drupal. We want it to be like Joomla. And we have to be very clear with people that it is not content management software, nor will it ever be become content management software, it, it really is a wiki. Uh, recently with on, within the media wiki world, we uh, created a wiki project. We're starting to build some of those up within the media wiki software site. And this is a, a project that helps coordinate uh, system admins who are generally the folks kind of running the third party wikis. So if you run a third party wiki and you're interested in, in collaborating with others, uh, you can go to that web page. There are also note cards in the back of the room. Uh, can you pass me? Just those two right there. Um, they look like this. This is the one that's for, and that's the logo we use for sysadmins. Uh, so if you'd like to join that project, there's also an enterprise mailing list that we're going to be 
sort of merging more towards a third party wiki mailing list to help those folks um, organize. And the reason the organization becomes important is because that way they can collaborate on what extensions we would like to encourage developers to work on or try to fundraise to hire developers to work on specific extensions. Um, so there's a lot of interesting ways that the third party wikis are starting to uh, collaborate. Um, so I have got five minutes left in mine, uh, and I wanted to know if there were any questions, and if not, I had a couple questions for you guys. But first, do you have questions for me, other than the shock that you're all still going through, that there are wikis outside of Wikimedia? I know you're all still, it's morning, it takes a while to absorb that shock, so I, I appreciate that. But, uh, were there any specific questions? Yes? I, well, I have a few comments from you. Then. Yeah. Uh, I think you left out the single biggest usage of wikis, which is for pop culture topics like the, like the Star Wars wiki. Yeah, I sort of, we sort of bunched that into knowledge sharing. Uh, but yeah I, yeah, I see. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, second, second. Uh, there is, uh, you should, it's probably good to acknowledge that there's wiki software outside of media wiki. What? Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. You can go to, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I want to make sure I don't cut off your train of thought. Okay, um, that is true. That is a very valid point. I am very biased to MediaWiki. I work on the MediaWiki software. I've been a consultant for MediaWiki software for four or five years. But it is fair to know um, that there are indeed a number of other Wiki software out there. And there's a really wonderful page if you go to, if you go to Wikipedia, I know that's a shock, and go to Wikis, there's a, a, a link there that breaks down all the different software. There's also an external website um, that does it all, but I don't necessarily always feel comfortable plugging a website unless they're sort of represented. Uh, yeah. That's fine. The third one is, I, I think Wikimedia movement is kind of an odd name. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, You're telling me. <laughs> um, I think community works, works uh, just as well because it doesn't imply that people are striving toward something. I tend to, I, well, my personal opinion is, is it shouldn't be called Wikimedia anything because I think it gets really confusing with Wikimedia movement. However, um, that was not anything I was ever a part of. So unfortunately, I'm using, we try to be very consistent in our terminology um, and whomever on the meta land, that was what they moved with. So that's what we try to be consistent with. I tend to agree though, but I, I try to be consistent in the language just to not confuse folks and movement seems to be how we word it. Uh, but yes, I agree. Okay, my actual question, sorry. It's okay. Can you explain more about the, the fundraising thing? Like, is there any mm -hmm. sort of document reference about that as far as, like, uh, you know, what, what the process is and what it's going to be? Fundraising for MediaWiki itself or fundraising? Yeah, I mean, you talked about, you know, getting, getting resources, to, getting funds to, mm -hmm. to fund. It's a very complex question, to be honest, uh, or answer. There, because Wiki, Media Wiki is currently underneath uh, the foundation, we're, we're very much dependent on the foundation allocating resources. Um, but there are outside examples. Microsoft, for example, has hired someone recently to help uh, modify the software so it works on their Views server. But right now, there isn't really an organized method of fundraising or financially supporting um, the Media Wiki software. It's interesting you had mentioned that I was literally been having conversations with people over the last three days on that exact topic uh, of how do we get funds specifically for the Media Wiki software, but at this exact moment, uh, that doesn't exist. We're, we're very much dependent on the, the foundation's commitment um, to supporting outside wikis, which is a kind of an ongoing discussion. Um, I think we're getting close to that, though, to be honest. I think we're getting very close to a point where organizations that have a very invested interest in the media wiki software will be able to support its specific development, but I don't work at the foundation, so I obviously can't speak to that, but that's my personal hunch. Uh, were there any other? Yeah. Can you talk about the characteristics of successfully sustainable That's actually a really excellent question, and it's a discussion that we're often having uh, amongst sys admins. I think one of the first steps that we're starting to encourage is to really research and find other successful wikis, talk to those administrators, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, what my experience has been is we often tell people, you need to wait, you know, it's going to take two or three years to build a really solid, active wiki community, which seems to be reasonably consistent. It's not always the case. Sometimes with like video games, a new version of Fallout comes
comes out at the Fallout wiki and Wikia just gets a flood of new users. Um, but in the general knowledge base communities, it does take some time to build it up. What we've often seen, or what I've, again, this is just personal experience, what I've often seen is very successful is to begin by looking at the templates and how you want the pages to look and getting all of those pieces together, kind of the technical pieces, and then to start building up some example articles. Uh, and as soon as you start putting content up there and as soon as you start making it very clear that it is open to edit and they're using the appropriate copyleft copyrights, um, other people tend to engage. Another thing that's been very successful for uh, small wikis is creating a lot of categories, pages early on, even if they're not articles in them, um, to help begin showing people how to uh, uh, organize the data a little bit better. On Wikipedia, they're very used to having hundreds and hundreds of categories to pick from, but on a brand new wiki, those category pages don't exist. Um, so really sort of leading by example. Another tip that I personally offer clients when they're doing community ones is um, Wikipedia did sort of use a benevolent dictator model in its first couple of years to help set a tone and to set a direction. Um, and while I think it is very conceivable to run community-based and committee-based wikis, I've often found that in the early stages it is helpful to have one or two or a very small body that has sort of the final decision in those first couple of years. Otherwise you will spend really the first six or eight months talking about logos and template design, you know, things that aren't really necessarily advancing um, the wiki, what kind of copyright policies we're going to allow, things like that. But generally the simple answer is research, uh, read, um, network, and that generally is, is uh, uh, most successful measures. Out of curiosity, we've got a, a couple more minutes. Um, did anybody have any tips if they're running or their experience with a third party wiki that they wanted to share to kind of respond to that? Anything they've had within their communities, even if it was a small uh, Wikimedia Foundation project that's often helpful as well. Anyone? Yeah. One comment I've run into and found a solution for uh, outside wikis that are used to battling spam. Right. There's a website called deathbycaptcha.com. They break recapture, 1,000 captures broken for $1.39. Yeah. Uh, instead, Questy Capture seems to be a very simple, very effective way of keeping the spammers at bay. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for, for mentioning that. A lot of times small wikis run into spam inundation and they become spam hubs. And anyone who knows what a Bitcoin is uh, has come to loathe that term with a serious passion. <laughs> yes? Uh, this is really out of uh, the UK chapters, mm -hmm. two wikis. Uh, I'd absolutely mm -hmm. reinforce what you said about categories, mm -hmm. which uh, we've been going for, at least one of them's been going for about three or four years, and we haven't used categories, and it's appalling. Um, mm -hmm. Also, things like you know main pages, portal pages yep. with the links, and also archiving stuff. Uh, stuff tends to just get abandoned. Right. Uh, you know, so you have probably set up an archive category. Right. And also, we have terrible problems with people loading up documents as PDFs, mm -hmm. uh, just as files without explanatory heading. So mm -hmm. You can't find them on search, and the name is meaningless. Yeah. It, so we're kind of how not to do it, frankly, <laughs> which I've only recently got. And I think he, the, some of the points that he brought up was uh, the UK chapters, wikis have run into issues of not having categories or having people begin to put content in in ways that are not helpful. Um, and so that's where it is good to spend some time before you publicly launch it, thinking through some policies, setting up some examples. Um, and to be honest, I think the expression of you know good artists borrow, great artists steal, it's okay to look at other successful wikis, look at their policies. I often borrow Wikipedia policies. My concept usually is it's, we've spent about eight years developing them, so there must be some sanity behind them. That's not always the case, but uh, sometimes it's a good rule of thumb. So don't be afraid to do that. Uh, certainly I know the Wikipedia community has been very, very supportive of that, and I have borrowed policies from them several times and never once received a nasty, you stole a policy I wrote and didn't tell everyone that I wrote it, kind of an email. I'm sure that will come now, but I haven't yet received one. Um, so certainly don't be afraid to do that and look at what other uh, wikis are doing and, and borrow and steal from their concepts, especially the Wikipedia ones and the Wikimedia movement wikis. Those are obviously very successful and, and show a good uh, way to do that. Yeah. Uh, any other comments, questions? Yes, in the back. I, I found with uh, all the internal wikis I work on, the most useful thing is to have lots of uh, portal pages or just links of articles because, but yeah, most of the people I work with, uh, it takes a while to even explain that you're supposed to post stuff on site rather than just uploading Word files as files. So. Right. 
they're, so they're not going to link everything and add categories. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's super important to have tons of oral pages where just a list of every article we have here. So, and that's what more people are used to on other parts of the web, just having a list of all links rather than having everything. Yeah, exactly. I think um, uh, the kind of the, the message I wind up often taking from that is um, that, again, when we look at what people are very commonly familiar with, we know that portals work on Wikipedia. We generally know that wiki projects work. And you kind of want to think that there's different types of personalities out there. So how do you integrate all of those different types of personalities? Some people like to work kind of anonymously. Some people like to be recognized for their work. Other people like to be team members. So when you're developing a when you're developing a, a wiki community, you want to think about how can I capture all of those types of people. So that's why not focusing on just one strategy, using portals, using wiki projects, uh, having volunteers with titles, things like that can really be helpful in those early stages of getting community momentum going, especially recognizing volunteers. If you, like, I often will find a spam meister or a chief spam slicer or recognize somebody who's really going above and beyond and trying to eliminate spam. And by doing that, they often get very excited they bring their friends on, and they recruit others to help them with eliminating spam. You can sort of see how you know, the, the psychology evolves and, and people really try to run with it. Um, so again, you know, mar borrowing from as many ideas as possible and really diversifying your approach. Any other questions, comments? Yes, last one. I'm a long time user of iWikipedia, mm -hmm. having recently done some work to look at different libraries for writing bots to populate content in and pull it out. Mm -hmm. iWikipedia seems really pretty locked into the core media wiki Wikis. Right. And for Python, I found PyWiki tools much easier, and Perl Media Wiki bot. But bots as a way of getting content in and curating your site mm -hmm. are tremendously powerful. That's a really good point. Um, if you're not familiar with bots, I highly, I think the bot sessions have already concluded, but I highly encourage you to go to MediaWiki.org. Uh, in general, the best tip I can ever give to people is communicate, ask, network, talk to other people. There are the IRC rooms and the mailing list, so definitely utilize them and make sure that people know what you're trying to do and uh, that you're getting your ideas out there and hearing from other people's ideas. Uh, very, very last one, because then we do have to get on. And hopefully in the future, the concept is eventually an installer will be developed that will allow you to say, I'm this kind of a wiki, I want bots, I want this, and it'll help install that for you. But that's kind of in the grand wish list of things we'd like to do in the long haul. OK, so that is uh, it for me. I want to bring up our next um, uh, presenter uh, whose topic I'm blanking on at this exact moment. Uh, OK, uh, open systems management lessons from the internet. Uh, so if you could please give him a warm welcome. Great to see you guys. I'm thrilled to be here. I, um, I'm kind of a, a Wikipedia hanger on admirer from a distance. I've done a little bit, but not a whole lot. It's my first Wikimania. And I, I got to say, I was pretty thrilled on Thursday to look up at all the people uh, in Listener Auditorium when Mary and Jimbo were giving their talks and, and think about, you know, a thousand people getting together to talk about, you know, to, 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 to focus on this, this amazing product that people are building together uh, out of just common interest. And it's, it's just a thrill. Um, and then, and then the other thing that I'm excited about is I've been, I've been working on this silly paper for a year or so where I want to try to draw lessons out of these kinds of experiences. And I feel like I'm, I'm getting to come kind of talk to the experts about it. So I'm really hoping that uh, you can give me some feedback either in the room or, or afterwards about how or whether or not this information resonates with you. I was trying to think of what a good example of this is. And it's, I decided it's kind of like being able to go to Chicago and talk with Rahm Emanuel about politics or something like that. So like I'm, I'm in the right spot to be talking about these things. Um, the, the point of, the, of my, my question is, what can we learn from how the internet was built about designing and managing ambitious collaborative social initiatives? And, and I used it, I've been thinking about it in the, in the context of the internet, which I'm using in a broad sense. It's kind of everything. It's the web, it's, it's all the media, it's all the soft, all the open source software, and Wikipedia is certainly one of the key example projects of the last 40 years. But we really are looking back 40 years, and it is so cool, you know? I mean, in 1969, this was what the internet looked like, right? This is ARPANET with the original four nodes, you know, on the back of the napkin. And this is what we look like today, right? Or in 2005 or so, you know, I mean, this, we, we are now this kind of neural network of huge scope and scale. And, and we've done that over the course of a little over 40 years. So what did we do? 
And how can we capture lessons from that to do it again in other formats? And, and in particular, my interest is how do we do it in formats that aren't necessarily software development and technology? If you think about the growth curve, right, of the internet overall, this is just kind of, you know, nodes on the internet. It's just an amazing power curve. And, um, and it takes off, you know, kind of way down, way down the path, right? So there's a whole lot of stuff happening before we kind of hit the World Wide Web and launch, launch north. Um, but, but what we've done over the course of that 40 years are at least three things that projects in government and nonprofits in particular, that's been kind of my orientation, are really interested in doing. One is we've generated a ton of creativity and innovation. We've solved a lot of problems that people didn't even know they could be solved. We've, we've made, reached massive scale, right? We're talking about almost a third of the world now being able to connect. Um, far more devices on the internet than there are people on the planet. Um, and we've had huge impact. We've transformed and destroyed industries. We've created new industries. We've, you know, we've, we've just, again, had, had these things happen that people 30 years ago couldn't have imagined were possible, you know, beyond, beyond a few science fiction writers. So we want to replicate these things. We want to do them some more. And so what I did is I tried to go back through and just kind of broadly think about the history of the internet. And I, 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 it's in more detail in the paper, but, but I kind of broke it into four or five stages. And the first stage was ARPANET. Um, and and it, it really was kind of starting from scratch. We had, you know, uh, Taylor sitting in his office at DARPA with three terminals in his office saying, connected to three different computers and wondering why he had to have three different terminals and why the computers didn't talk to each other, right? So they commission a project and they start to hook them together. You know, UCLA talks to Stanford. They, they, they type in L O and the connection crashes. You know, they have to go back, they write some new code, and they get it running later that afternoon. So the first connection's made in 1969. They add UC uh, Santa Barbara and Utah a little bit later that year, and we now have a network of four computers where we're actually able to share resources. Um, we're, we start immediately writing kind of the underlying code, FTP, Telnet, systems like that. And we do things like create internet email, right? Networking email, email that goes from one computer to another computer, right? So you have, so you invent the at sign. Um, and, and we choose, you know, the at sign's chosen because it makes sense, right? I mean, we just kind of solve it. Somebody picks it. Um, and we have the first international conference on computer communications just kind of across town at the Hilton Hotel by DuPont Circle. And then this is kind of proud for me because that was the topic of the only Wikipedia article I've ever created is this, this one. It's just a stub, but it, you know, I created it, it's still there. Um, so, so we got ARPANET started, and ARPANET is this one cohesive network run by the Defense Department. It slowly migrates so that there's got, it moves out of DARPA into another section of the Defense Department. National Science Foundation gets involved with it, but, but that isn't really the point. The point that like Cerf and Bob Kahn and these guys who are thinking about this stuff what, is, is not just to build a network, it's to connect together all kinds of networks. What about the satellites? What about the radios, right? How do we connect the Navy ships to this thing? Um, you know, and of course, Ben Cerf's really fun. If you've listened to him talk recently, he's talking about how do we connect spaceships and other planets, right? So the man's got a big, big mind and very ambitious. So they get together and they write TCP, which then becomes TCP and IP in 1977. Um, eventually, by 83, ARPANET, that one network, is running on TCP and IP. And what's important is we've now, we've now jumped from, from the one network into many networks, right? And we really have a network of networks. We have an internet at work. And we're continuing to build all kinds of software infrastructure, right? And it's not just like, oh, you build a product and then you stop. You build a product and then you build it again, and then you build it again, and then you build it again, right? You go from news A to news B to news C, right? To NNTP, and, and then you launch it again. And so over and over again, we're building new and new layers of software infrastructure by building off of work that other people have already done. Well, it finally breaks loose in the 90s, right, with the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. Um, offering up HTML, HTML, HTTP, a working web server, kind of posting it online and saying, hey, look at this, right? Anybody want to help? At the same time, about the same time, Torvald's starting to launch Linux. You know, I'm going to start a small operating system project. Anybody interested in helping? Um, in 1992, we let non-researching government entities onto the internet. I don't know who's on the internet in 1992. It's like, I like immediately got my CompuServe account so I could go like use Gopher. Um, pretty frustrating experience, frankly. 
Um, and then by 1993, Mosaic is released, and Mark Andreessen, you know, becomes a, a golden child. Um, but 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 the you know the big deal of of Mosaic is it has pictures, right? We got pictures now. And then you move on to the next generation, which is, I think, where I would put Wikipedia, the Web 2.0 thing. It's not, it's no longer just push, right? It's back and forth. People are talking to each other. We're able to form networks within our networks. This is actually the graphics, kind of funny. I, I picked it off a of Flickr. It's a dead pool. These are all the firms that have died, you know, some of the firms that have died during this era. But we start to, uh, we start to think about RSS. We're feeding information out, APIs. We get to use Google Maps. Um, the open licensing stuff is getting more and more sophisticated, GNU and then uh, Creative Commons. And, and there's a lot of focus on the user contributor and, and um, as the user as the, as the owner and the producer of information. And this is about the time where you know, Time Magazine does the cover where you know, the, the man of the year is you. And they tried to do that silly silver mirror that didn't really work that well. And then I think you know, we're clearly in into another wave of development today, uh, cloud computing, mobile, I don't know what else is going to be characterized this wave of development, but, but it's continuing, right? We're not stopping. This is going to be another generation of, of innovation and creativity. Arguably along the same kinds of lines that we've seen so far, although you know, I don't think that's a sure thing. I think it's possible that you could see the internet you know, fractured become co uh, uh, either corporate controlled or, or, or government controlled, fragmented and split up and kind of uh, broken. So um, it's, it's nothing that we should be too sanguine about. But, um, but we are moving into another generation of, of opportunity. So what do you take from all this? And one of the things I took from this is that the internet development was characterized by what I would call open projects. That there were many individual projects, often run by volunteers, often building upon the work of previous projects that were um, creating this thing that we now call the internet. And we did it over this, this two-generation time period, incrementally improving and expanding and building upon each other. Right? And so the issue is, what are the characteristics of these open projects, and how do we replicate them in other places? And so what I'd like to do is just kind of quickly run through what I'm thinking these things are, and then uh, get ideas from you guys of whether or not this resonates at all if you see things that I haven't seen. Um, I mean, one of the thoughts was that these projects actually kind of depend on being open. You know, that open is porousness. It's porous to funding. It's porous to staffing, uh, decision making. You know, there's a fluidity to the project that isn't the traditional, certainly not the traditional Washington, D.C. kind of structure. You know who your staff is. You know what your budget is. You know, your big argument is to get a bigger budget next year, right? These are different structure of orientation. And I think we could kind of do side by side and say, well, actually, there's a lot of dimensions that closed and open projects are different upon. From, from leadership, you know, who is the, the leader, whether we have the benevolent dictator or whether there's a senior manager or whether leadership is kind of ambiguous. Uh, the difference between maybe leadership and authority who makes the decisions, right? There may be uh, distinctions in leaders who are uh, helping things happen but aren't necessarily making all the decisions. Membership, whether I'm clearly in or out, like with Wikipedia, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in, I'm kind of a member. A lot of the closed organizations don't have the flexibility to have people that are partially in. The idea of anonymous members, I don't even know that you're out there, but you're supporting me. Uh, ownership, the idea that we have open ownership, the idea of Creative Commons uh, is, is pretty revolutionary, right? The ability to create something and then share it with other people. The boundaries of the project, exactly where it stops and where the next one be begins. I think Greg's talk about what's going on with, Wiki, with, the, with uh, Media Wiki is kind of a cool one because it's like the boundaries just keep kind of marching out. Um, what are the objectives of the project? Who decides what these objectives are? Uh, the decision making process, is this done consensually? Is it done by acclamation? Is it done by fiat? Um, lots of different organizational structures. Uh, why do we participate? In a lot of closed organizations, you participate because you're paid. Right? What we've done, I think, in the internet space to a large extent is created a whole set of new incentives. You're participating because you wanted to experiment with an operating system. You wanted to make a contribution. You wanted to learn something. You wanted to feel valuable. You know, there's a whole bunch of new incentives that we're exploring. I think we've experimented a lot with location. I think these projects, you know, the idea that you've got 2,000 people developing MediaWiki, you've got 400 of them sitting in a chat room. Well, you know, the location now is a chat room. Right, that's an internet-driven phenomenon. We didn't used to have any equivalent to that until we created it ourselves. Um, 
and the idea of work time. You know, the fact that this is happening in our pajamas, uh, as uh, as Sue was talking about this morning, like we're sitting there editing in our pajamas somewhere, you know, whenever. Um, all of these things are flexibilities that we haven't traditionally seen in the normal way that we do work and that we run projects. And I'd love to kind of improve this list and, and, and think of other dimensions. If you guys have ideas or suggestions on, on what else is different between kind of what you do during your work day, perhaps, and what you do when you're working on uh, Wikipedia, it would be helpful to me to, to write those down. From this, I tried to come up with a series of what I thought of as tips. If you're thinking about running, pro and, and I guess it's fair to say that open and closed are probably a continuum. Right? There's projects that are more open and there are projects that are more closed. And you actually kind of go back and forth and you probably go back and forth on multiple dimensions. Some of them have stronger authority, some of them have you know, different kinds of decision making, whatever. Um, but I tried to come up with kind of 12 tips that I thought were tendencies that we saw in open projects that helped us make these projects work. So again, one of the questions for you guys is do these echo at all your experience or what you've been seeing in the projects that you have been working on? Um, the first one seems to be let everybody play, right? Let people in. This is the idea that staffing is porous, that we can have other people contributing, and, and to, to the extent that, that they can be anonymous. We, we, we don't even know who, who is contributing in some situations. And the, you know, Tim Berners-Lee's line when he announced uh, HTML and HTTP was collaborators welcome, right? Puts it out on a listserv and says, let's get started. Uh, Torvalds does the same thing in his email announcing his project I'm doing a free operating system. It's just a hobby. Won't be big and professional. Right? Um, and, and it's that kind of openness to collaboration, I think, that really characterizes. You know, that's kind of the cornerstone to this. And the other side of it, the, this letting everybody, people, everybody play, is that the internet world solves its own problems. It, kinda, it doesn't really wait for uh, an authority to step in and decide how things were done. Um, it, 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 it has a, um, you know, we can do it ourselves mentality that I think is very important. Well, if you're going to invite everybody in, that means you've got to play kind of nice. So the, the idea that you can be inviting in your culture, that you have to be kind of, you have to be positive, it, I think is a strong tendency amongst these projects. And, and the, the RFCs, um, does everybody know what the requests for comments are on, on the internet? Yeah, so uh, just to give you a quick overview then, uh, the requests for comments were started back in 1969. And the first one defined the interface between the um, kind of the, there, there was an imp computer that sat between the computer they were trying to talk to and the network. And, there was a, and the folks at UCLA were trying to write the interface definition for what, how that communications was going to work. They kind of thought there was somebody out there who was going to tell them how it was going to work. But they couldn't wait for them because the computer was sitting there on the dock. So they were writing it down. And they wrote an, a request for comment that described the process. And the guy that wrote it, was, he talks about how he, he was you know, worried that, that somebody was going to come and slap down this, co you know, this college student for having done this. So he wrote a really gentle note. It's like really collaborative and opening. And that set the tone for the RFC series. The RFC series now tends to have the definition of pretty much all the major definitions that have gone through the internet, plus a bunch of April Fool's jokes and things like that. Uh, six or 7,000 different requests for comments. But they have tended to keep this be nice kind of tone that goes with them. And what's funny is they're written to, they originally were written to the network working group. And the network working group was basically anybody that's interested. There was no group. It was just a, a, a community of interest. Um, tip three, try to talk about what you're doing while you do it. What David Weiner talks about it as narrating your work. Turns out if you're going to have a lot of people involved in a project and they don't necessarily know each other, just putting your information out there so that they can listen becomes a critical part of communications and coordination. Right? So talk pages are critical so they can coordinate across Wikipedia articles. Um, the, 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 the notes in the, um, our code archives about uh, bug repairs and, and submissions, right? Those kinds of things. Also, just how, why we make decisions. I, I really enjoyed the talk that Sue gave this morning because you know, most organizations, you would spend almost the whole time talking about fundraising and your budgetary situation. You know, what she's talking about is how are we going to get more uh, and diverse editors. Right? And here's the steps that we're going through. This is why we're thinking about that. To, in my mind, that's a pretty good example of narrating the work. You're talking about what you're doing while you're doing it. You're not just announcing successes. Right? You're actually interacting with a wide group of people around what it is you want to achieve and how you're going about it. Part of that talking then 
tip four is to use many different layers of communications. All right? So amongst the developer community, the IRC channels have become very important. Um, but we've written all these different things. We've, we've written wikis, we've written blogs, we've written uh, a tweet, Twitter. We, you know, we, we've, we've solved, we've like added layers and layers of communications. And it seems to be useful to use many of these different layers as we're running these projects. Um, give it away, right? The open source licensing. One of the advantages here is that there's an or if we want to have great impact, one of the advantages of giving it away is that you can have increasing returns to scale. Your contribution then is built on by other people and it just keeps going up with that great curve that you see from the internet. Um, bring in different people, right? Think about the edges. Don't have the, don't work with the same people over and over again. Right? Deliberately reach into a new country, a new language, right? do the kinds of things that Wikipedia has been doing to, to get new ideas, to get new stimulation, to get new resources. Um, get something that works first and then make it more complicated. Right? Start simple, seems to be a general rule. Um, and you know, in RFC 1958, which is a great, I kind of like went back to RFC 1958 over and over again, realizing I'm just trying to rewrite it because they actually defined a whole bunch of these characteristics, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, make it work, then standardize, right? The idea, the role of standards is no longer uh, I'm top down. I'm going to decide for you. Here's your standards. What you're doing is you're making something work, demonstrating that it works, and you're recruiting support for your standards, right? So the idea of making it work first is critical. Um, use all kinds of different organizations. It's not just about you. You're in collaboration. It's definitely an ecosystem. We're using government agencies. We're using for-profit agencies. We're using non-profit agencies. We're using volunteers. Um, all kinds of different, and, and we're using the network working group, which doesn't really even exist. Um, deliberately design for participation. Modularize, granularize, make the problems uh, small. Invite people to participate in lots of ways. You can fix grammar, you can fix spelling, you can add links, you can add new articles, you can, you know, you can cu do community curation, uh, all kinds of different things. Make it easy to, for people to participate in lots of different ways. Um, deliberately increase your network impact. This idea of the networks of networks. Look for other people and other networks that you connect with and leverage off of them. I think one of the things we'll find that's important about MediaWiki working with other kinds of wikis is this kind of network impact. Uh, and tip 12 is build platforms. It's like don't solve all the problems yourself. Don't keep them internally. Um, do something that other people can build upon. So this idea that O'Reilly talks about with Tim Berners-Lee, he didn't build billions of websites. Just built some tools for other people to build billions of websites. So how do we think about platforms and helping other people solve the problems that they've got to solve? Um, so anyway, those are kind of the quick rundown of the ideas that I've had from looking at the experience we've had. I hope that some of these apply to Wikipedia, and I'd love to get your feedback. There's a few copies of the paper here, if anybody would like to have a dead tree version of the paper. Um, one of the case situations then is like, when do we use which format? How do we think about open versus closed? And that's one of the areas that I'd like to continue to work on in, in my work is like coaching people on being more open. I think our error, we tend to, we have a natural inclination to being closed. How do we work towards being open and using the strengths of openness? Um, and what situations those are going to work better in. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Greg, I, is there any time for questions? Or? Hey, you got one minute. One minute. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll time it next time. Yeah, Greg. Um, one, of the, one of the few sort of gaps in this approach that I've sort of observed is that just because something is open doesn't mean that diversity happens. Right. But there are other kinds of barriers that are maybe external to this ideology that will prevent you from having a truly uh, representative community. And so can you talk about any examples of best practices or, or approaches that actually take another step towards ensuring inclusion? Yeah, and I don't have, you know, I was, I really enjoyed Mary's talk yesterday talking about the ADA initiative because I felt like she was being much more imaginative about the stuff than I had been. It clearly is not true that this is, this is kind of, I feel like these things are necessary but not sufficient. Many more projects fail than succeed. So I was looking at the successes and saying, oh, they seem to have these characteristics. Don't know what the failures look like, really. Um, so I think the stuff that Mary talked about yesterday in terms of, you know, choice of language, how you're uh, bringing together groups, what groups you're bringing together are the kinds of things I would look like there. But... And I don't know who's doing it really well. It'd be really interesting to find groups that are doing it really well. Thanks, guys.
How's everyone doing today? Good? Oh, come on. A little better than that. How's everyone doing today? Yay! No, there. That was even bad, but I'm not going to try for a third time. <laughs> All right, yeah, I work at NASA Goddard. Uh, my name is John Verville. On, uh, well, my screen's coming up here um, on Wikipedia. Um, I haven't edited much at all, so if you look at my recent stats, um, you'll be like, where did this guy go? Um, but I, I started uh, and did a lot of editing in 2008 and 2009. They're about to have to push here. Um, and uh, it's actually kind of exciting to be here today. Can everyone hear me when I'm walking away from the mic? OK. Um, it's actually kind of exciting to be here because at some level, the career that I, I have moved into um, at NASA Goddard is, is I, I would say I owe at least three quarters of that to Wikipedia. And I'll kind of explain that briefly. So um, how many people, just to get a gauge of how long I should spend on, on, on different areas, um, first of all, how many people have actually developed on uh, MediaWiki? OK. How many people have used Semantic MediaWiki? All right, quite a few. And how many people have um, have worked with um, tools like Google Refine or or tapped into um, you know uh, DBpedia or other kind of data sets? Okay. All right. So I'll kind of I'm going to move quickly through a lot of the stuff at the beginning. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'm NASA Dash Verve on um, Wikipedia, and you'd think that would get me into trouble like paid editing or something like that. But, um, and previously, I was user uh, colon, I was John Verve. Um, and I'll go into that after at the end if someone wants to ask that as a question of why I did that. That's a long story, actually. But, um, so today, I'm going to be talking about Semantic Media Wiki I'm actually, and DBpedia and everything. But I'm actually going to do a, kind of a live demo. But I'm going to go into a little bit of the motivation. I, I heard a lot of you know, comments of there's other tools other than uh, MediaWiki as wikis. Um, thank you for the gentleman who, who mentioned that, I think. And, um, and we've used a lot of those internally. I've gone through five different wiki packages. Um, so we've done a lot of work. So let me just jump right in here. Um, so first of all, I have to kind of say who my giants are. You know, I, my, the work I've done is at, at, at Goddard and at NASA has been on the shoulders of all kinds of giants. And so first of all, I just want to mention Wikipedia. At some level, I don't even remember how I got into it. But uh, the fall of 2009, I really started getting into editing Wikipedia. Um, and really enjoyed it. I loved how a community can build this, this unbelievable resource that is depended upon by societies you know, across the world. Um, and, but but it's, it's just built by the community. And that community idea, just to me, like, I think just somehow it, it was a virus that took place, you know, a plant in my brain. And just it, it kind of like inspired me into thinking, like, how can we use this for the work that I'm doing at Goddard? Um, Intellipedia has been a great example. Um, I remember uh, it was about two years ago. Uh, how many people know who Chris Rasmussen is? He's kind of the, the at least the public-facing you know, brainchild and, and spokesman for Intellipedia. I remember sharing a beer with him at a at a uh, OpenGov conference, and just him telling me all the experiences and all the work that they had done, and just seeing how it had. Well, if it can work with the Department of Defense, who has all the security restrictions, why couldn't it work for us? Um, and then OpenGov. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much, but it's an initiative um, of the uh, um, Obama administration, uh, I believe, three years ago, four years ago. We kind of, you know, have transparency, um, collaboration, um, and you know, it, that, that just seeing how people have taken hold of that, it really has inspired me. And of course, la lastly, I got to show a picture of Jimbo here. <laughs> um, so I work at NASA Goddard. I've been there for almost a decade now. Um, my background actually is in communication engineering, so building essentially uh, the radios for satellites and the ground systems. Um, it's a facility that has about 12,000 people. Um, and one of my inspirations um, for editing on Wikipedia, too, is, is my, I believe it's four times or five times, um, great uncle is actually Alfred Verville, one of the aviation pioneers. And it was neat, because that was probably one of the biggest kind of projects I undertook. How many people in their editing on Wikipedia have almost kind of like had a focus? And, and had like a project that really you kind of, this is my thing. OK, just, you want to just name off a few. Just speak up. It's a little louder, please. Scientific method. OK, a couple others. OK, someone else? 
the island of Karachi, Croatia. Cool. Yeah, so mine for this period of time was, was my you know, great uncle far times removed, um, Alfred Verl, and I created an info box and I created all this stuff around it and it was exciting to see like my creation come alive because there wasn't a lot of stuff on there before about his information. Um, so where I work, so I just want to give that as a little segue. So where I work um, at NASA Goddard, um, it's named after Robert Goddard, the, the rocket pioneer. Um, we have 10,000 scientists and engineers. It was founded in 1959, um, just after uh, NASA was founded. Um, our specialty is building, and this is kind of, you know, the domain that we work in, is, is, is cradle to grave of Earth and space science satellites. So how many people have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? Okay. We, were, we managed that project. Um, the servicing missions, building it, conceiving of it, figuring out what kind of science we want to do. How many people have heard of John Mather? A uh, couple. Okay, John Mather uh, had won the Nobel Prize um, for basically detecting um, the you know cosmic background radiation. Um, I'm sure if you guys have seen the picture, the colored picture of the oval, um, you would recognize it. Um, we built over 300 satellites um, and a thousand balloon missions. Um, we, we've published all kinds, you know, we have 50,000 in Earth science and 40,000 space science publications, many of which have, have, have in, in their own areas, have revolutionized kind of an area of these, these areas of science. 10,000 patents and one Nobel Prize. We've, uh, here's a couple um, missions. And so you can imagine that, you know, we've, we, and we've had great success, but you can imagine that, um, um, you know, you'd think that, okay, these guys have a great organization, it runs very well, but these kind of things actually within you know, the greater NASA happen. How many people know what this picture is of? Someone, someone just brought it out? Exactly. And our example kind of most recently is of uh, a satellite, and I'm not going to get into too many details because I, can, I, can, I don't want to slander my organization, but at some level what happened here is these, this, this was a satellite called NOAA N prime. Anyone heard of that? Okay, but basically what happened is they forgot to put the bolts back in this turnstile and they started lifting it up. And sometimes you have to tilt the, the satellite over to actually get it to, um, tilt the satellite over to actually work on it, you know, and add parts and, and, and test it. And uh, they forgot the bolts and they cost, I think it was, it was about uh, $200 million because of this tip over accident. And so, even though we've had great success, we've had challenges. And this kind of leads me to the impetus. And this is the report that came out of the Columbia, um, which in 2007 was a satellite that um, you know, blew up on reentry. Um, in our view, the NASA organization culture has as much, organizational culture has as much to do with this accident as the foam. And, and so how do we transform our organization in a way and, and leverage, maybe leverage information tools, web tools, to kind of um, transform that. So I'm just going to run really quickly through this. So, so what I've tried to do is use wikis to capture this tacit knowledge. Um, and tacit knowledge is kind of the hands-on, experiential knowledge. Um, and I'm just going to jump through here and break down silos. So often we have so many silos within organizations um, that kind of do their own thing. And I guess in society you could think of it as silos too. You have people who have expertise in a certain area and they know they're, they're experts you know, either as a hobbyist or professionally, right? But how do we break these silos down? And I think Wikipedia, just in general, um, is a great example of how those silos have been broken down by allowing people to find, contribute to, and evolve kind of this knowledge database, right? Um, and with our organization, we've, we, we've, I've tried to use this paradigm of kind of the top down versus the bottom up, kind of the aristocracy, right? This, the people who are you know, in control because they, they, something is true because they say so, right? Whereas oftentimes it's not always that way and, and the, the grassroots of an organization knows it's different. Um, so I'm not going to go into this. I, I, I put some of these things in here just so if people want to read the slides afterwards they can kind of get some background information. Um, but, but a lot of it is just kind of an open system that people can get to within our organization without even logging in, without anything. One differentiator between our, a lot, all the systems I work with for NASA and Wikipedia is that you have to log in because we just have different requirements. We have um, sensitive information, so there's, there's pieces that we have to safeguard. Um, we've used wikis to kind of centralize or, uh, information, um, importing it, you know, linking to it, and so essentially kind of this dashboard idea that I you know, was mentioned in a couple of the previous two talks. Um, 
I, I was glad to hear David kind of talk about this, you know, there's a spectrum of openness and a spectrum. And, and I've kind of, in previous talks, I've, ta I've, I've gone into this idea of many to many, I'm sorry, many to many, one to few to many, and then kind of everything, something that everyone has access to, like, like the public nasa.gov site, down to things that are very restrictive and they have ITAR information. Um, and we've tried to essentially, in the bottom right here, if you, sorry, it's a little small here, the goal of making it more inclusive and more open, the system. And, uh, and through that, I've, I've worked, and I'm just going to jump through because I don't have a lot of time here. Um, so we started um, prototyping in 2009, started with MediaWiki, um, with, with some of our systems. Um, we still have a MediaWiki <coughs> installation. And so sor sorry I can't show a lot of this stuff to you guys because it's you know, sensitive information, but there are things I can show you for sure. Um, and we start with MediaWiki, and then we um, have evaluated all kinds of different platforms. Right now, we use MediaWiki and Confluence. How many people have heard of Confluence? Yeah. So we use those are the two primary packages we use for Wiki um, at, at within our engineering organization. Um, to, in July 2010, we launched the, the full system. Um, and uh, the neat thing is we got some funding for a small data effort, and then um, we uh, expanded that. Um, data effort in July, and then we got some actual real funding. Um, actually, just uh, that's going to be coming here in September. Um, so I kind of want to explain this data piece, and I'm sure that's why, why a lot of you even came who are here just for this piece. Um, this, this managing this data relationships is one of the, the key pieces that we've had trouble doing. Because right now what we are doing is a lot of document-centric work, right? A lot of it is we produce these, you know, thousand-page manuals. I heard one time that the, the space shuttle operating manual was something. If you printed it out, it would be something on the order of 36,000 pages. I mean, you just just try to boggle the mind about how how many specializations of people and how many niches. I mean, there, one person couldn't possibly know all the details of that particular system. Um, and so, what we're trying to do is go from document-centric to this data-centric vision, um, and 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 uh, so. We have a system on, the, on, on our internal networks that essentially have this taxonomy. And this is, this is a very high level of the taxonomy. And I'll go through it very briefly. Where essentially we have a, a spacecraft in a certain cat. We have all kinds of categories. We have um, use a, an elaborate tagging system. Um, and then we have um, different products and technologies. So you can really think of it in this way. I'll do a quick analogy of your cell phone. So within a cell phone, there has to be a screen. There has to be, you know, um, some type of buttons. There has to be the case, the, the mechanical case that the, that the uh, phone is in. Um, there has to be, you know, a communication system that talks to the cell phone tower. And so that's what I mean when I say products and technology. We break them down into those those uh, those pieces, and and we have kind of wiki pages. So each of these. You know, rectangles you see is essentially a wiki page that is editable by any of our engineers and uh, technologists at uh, NASA Goddard. And then you have organizations. So essentially, we have these different pieces of data, and we have this database, and we use uh, MediaWiki to be able to track, you know, the, the editing. So um, one of the big things for us is this kind of, um, you know, uh, information assurance. How do we know that this information in here? Is, is accurate because we have things changing all the time. Um, it looks like you know you see the space shuttle. Oh, that that's one ship. You know the the five space shuttles that were built were actually they had a lot of little nuanced differences, but you wouldn't know that. And the people working on them, you know, had to make those changes and and based on you know what technology was available, what parts were available. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we have to keep track of in terms of data. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is this spacedb.com. And this is kind of the outward-facing efforts that I've been doing um, with Semantic Media Wiki. And so you can go there right now. It, it, it's kind of uh, in, in nascent stages, um, but uh, it's space-db.com. And essentially, it's built on Semantic Media Wiki. Um, and the front page just kind of has you know, a, a few highlighted featured missions. But then when you drill down in there, you can see a lot more missions. Um, and we're, we're populating it. What we're trying to do is get authorization to kind of export some of the internal controlled data pieces and push it into this external piece. So, you know, folks like yourself can contribute, and, and we're trying to build, you know, the community around this as well. So if you're interested in maybe uh, helping or, or, or actually kind of looking for a community manager for it, you know, come and talk to me afterwards. I'd be very interested in, in chatting. Um, but essentially, you know, we've, 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 we've massaged a lot of data 
um, to get it into formats that we need. Um, and someone had mentioned, you know, like PyWikiBot and some other ones that you can use to kind of uh, automatically import data. And, and we've used that, and we're actually starting to look into using semantic, um, semantic uh, media wiki plus, SMW plus. So here's our basic ontology um, that we use. Um, and this is um, for missions that have already launched. Um, so we have basically a mission name and all the kind of data, metadata. We have an event, event that essentially um, will link to a mission name. Um, we have the launch site for a mission. So every mission basically is launched somewhere. So that links to a launch site name. And then um, we have a launch pad that is you know, within a launch site. And then we have a launch vehicle um, that, that links to from the mission name. So essentially, when you have a mission, you, you, you already know all the events that happen at that, at, you know, based on that mission. You have um, a launch, you know, it was launched at a launch site. It was launched on a vehicle. Um, and so this is the, kind of our rudimentary, I think we've, this is like version five of our ontology um, for spacecraft. Um, so does anyone have any questions so far? I can just maybe take a quick one if it's okay. Um, and so we use, uh, we use Semantic Media Wiki, uh, Semantic Media, sem Semantic Maps, sorry my slide got goofed up. We use Semantic Results Format and uh, we use Semantic Forms. Um, and with now I'm actually going to just take you, I'm just going to go to the website here and uh, just kind of poke around and show you guys kind of what, um, what we've done. You're not going to like your recent changes. Uh-oh. Did somebody, did so, did, yeah, that, getting, getting, sp getting uh, spam control has been one of my biggest challenges on, on some of the public sites that I use. Okay. Um, so essentially, when you, when you drill down into one of the, um, you know, one of the elements here, basically within the page you kind of see, and, and this is all done with, um, you know, just MediaWiki templates um, and building them out. Um, so you have a launch date, uh, you know, identification, there's, a, you know, n different names, and these are things that, you know, kind of matter in the satellite realm. Um, you know, it's launched at a site, so there's a link to a site. Um, and so, for those of you who aren't as familiar, um, you can always browse the properties of a page in Semantic Media Wiki. And so you can kind of see the table of all the, the pieces of data here. Um, and here's the different events. So we basically link to the events. I kind of did a little, a little hack here. Um, I'll just view it as I'm not logged in for now. Where basically I did of, a, you know, the, the predicate of a, of a spacecraft. And then I had it put in kind of the parent. So I, used, I turned on, I turned on um, you know, uh, child pages, which you can do in MediaWiki, and then basically just had it point to its parent. Um, and so you can, as you probably know, you can easily go in here and, um, and it basically pulls out base page name and just puts it right in there. And it was kind of a hack how I put that together, but it seems to work. Um, and so feel free to, you know, browse through all the templates and the, and the kind of the, the lightweight ontology we've created. Um, but uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a neat experience building with this. It's, it's worked quite well. Um, in most cases, I link to um, files that are actually in um, the commons. And so you can see I use, uh, basically I turned on the link to the commons. So this, this, this file is actually not on my site. It's in the, you know, Wikimedia Commons. Um, so that makes it nice as one of the fields. You can just uh, type in the uh, MediaWiki Commons and just dump it right in there. Um, what I'll show you next is um, and if anyone has any questions, you know, speak up. What I'll show you now quickly is actually the uh, the instant. So, how many people have used Google Refine? Okay. And so I'll show you kind of the. Uh, and so if you just want to go to uh, port uh, 3333 on um, on that same server, you can actually get to Google Refine. I don't know if that's a bad idea to just put it out there, but I did. <laughs> um, but essentially. We have um, some sets of data that we've kind of cleaned up um, and used Google Refine to do so, and then used um, tools like PyWikiBot and some others to actually get some of the data in there. We've gotten a lot of rocket um, data in there so far, and we're working on actually getting the missions in there. Um, so essentially, you know, it has all these kind of same fields that you have seen before, right? Um, the, the, you know, the launch vehicle, the launch date, you know, different configuration pieces, the complex. Um, 
and all of this, I don't know, uh, but if anyone, you know, for those of you who've used it, you know this, but for those of you who haven't, it's, it's really a great way of processing when you have like spreadsheets or comma separate, you know, CSV files, and you want to get the data in to the system in a certain way. Um, Google Refine has done very well. I, I think, you know, if you, if you know like some scripting language very well, you could probably do a lot of this with Python or um, other toolkits or Perl or whatever. But for those, you know, of you who aren't as, as, as programming savvy, Google Refine, I think, can really do some neat things to just clean up the data and you can do, um, you know, let me just do one quick example um, where I go in, basically when I look at launch site, and you can do basically a text facet. And let me make that a little bigger for everyone here. And essentially what it does is, simply because the, 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 the string of characters is the same, it groups all the different things in that column together. So you can see that there's 774 um, you know, rows in this table that, ha that are Cape Canaveral for the launch site. So you can do some neat things and you can group things together. You can edit you know, all the elements by just simply clicking on edit and this will change all the different fields in this table. So there's some neat things you can do to actually get this you know, thing to, ma to massage the data. Because, um, I mean, hypothetically, I could release this out into the world and then people could manually put in data, you know, oh, copy and paste from Wikipedia or copy and paste from wherever. But it would be a whole lot easier if, if people could just do a development task and get this data that oftentimes exists in spreadsheets and other areas and just get it in. And on the enterprise side, you know, behind our firewall at Goddard, we've done a lot of the same kind of things. Um, and we've, um, we've, we've kind of used these tools to massage the data to get it into a format that's useful for us. Um, what we'll show you next is kind of some of the other ways we use different plugins. Um, so you can actually go to, I believe it's on plans. Let me see here. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a page in here. There you go, launch map. So what I can do is actually, so this is automatically pulling all the data within um, Semantic Media Wiki framework and plotting the, uh, the, the different launch sites um, and just pulling them right out. And so as we get, you know, build up this database more and more, um, you know, there's at least, you know, 20 or so in the United States, so this, will, this map will fill out really nicely. Um, and so you don't have to, we don't have to build widgets for each of these, we can just pull it in and the data is already there available for us. Um, and so uh, this uses semantic, the semantic maps extension um, and it's very easy to use. I don't know if you, if you haven't used it before. I mean, I'm literally, that's the code, right? It's very simple to just, you know, pull up a map. It's just pulling in everything that's, you know, in the category launch site and then pulls in the launch site location as a, as a uh, lat latitude and longitude and then formats it as a map and we're good to go. Um, one other thing I've, uh, we've put together here is, um, yeah, launch timeline. And so this is, uh, you know, a timeline of all the, the missions that we have in the system so far. Um, so this is, uses the uh, MIT Simile plugin, um, which, is just, which is packaged within, uh, um, you know, a Semantic Media Wiki extension. Um, and, and again, this, this is literally like, you know, very few lines of code, and it just, you know, pulls up this, uh, this timeline, um, which, which is interactive, and I can, you, can, you can actually fill this out with other pieces of data as you want to, um, so it's pretty simple. So uh, I think my time's very short here. Do I, does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Can you speak to how you manage access control? I heard you say you have some public-facing data and some... Right. Right, yeah, so we, um, IT security is insane if you work with sensitive data. Number two, if you're, if you're, NASA's kind of a, a big target, let's say, you know, and, 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 and China and, and a lot of other countries have, have traffic coming towards, you know, a lot of our IT systems. Um, so because of that, we have to be unbelievably secure, and I can go into, you know, we can have one-on-one -on -one -on -one afterwards. Essentially, you know, we use, we have, in, you know, kind of centralized authentication and single sign-on methods, and that's what we use for a lot of the systems. There are some systems that are behind a firewall, so you have to VPN in even to get to the system, so they're not even public-facing sites. And so those, you know, it's, it's a, it, as I said before, it's kind of a spectrum of, of you know, IT openness and security, too. Um, so it, 
goes all the way across the board. But centralized authentication has made our life easier in the last decade since we've, we've had it at NASA. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question comment. Uh, the question is, do you use Symantec PDU on any of the internal? Yeah, we do, yeah. I, I didn't talk too much about it because I, I, I told uh, some of my you know, security folks about it and they, they kind of threatened me, right. threatened me with my life. So I couldn't talk about that too much. That's why I tried to focus on kind of the forward, outward facing stuff we're doing. But we do, yeah, we use it quite a bit. Um, and uh, we're starting to use Semantic Media Wiki Plus and uh, Vulkan, um, what's the Vulkan product, Halo, uh, to kind of, you know, clean up the data sets and, and, and collaboratively kind of build an ontology um, as well. What features what functions have made you move there? Pardon? What features functions have made you move towards the Vulkan tools? Um, uh, I, I haven't personally used the Vulkan tools. Um, one of my developers has done a lot of the Vulkan stuff. I've, I've primarily just used Semantic Media Wiki, like, you know, just the core package. Um, so, uh, sorry, I can't uh, answer that particular question. But so it's I, one person's moving towards Vulkan stuff? Then. Yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of I investigating it um, and checking it out. Um, so I, I can ask him and get back to you if, you're, if you'd like to give me your so contact info. Well, generally, is SMW growing within NASA? Is there a I think so. I think when people, see the thing is there's all these kind of web development tasks and there's all these silos. So somebody will come in with, I have a need and here's how we can meet, meet that need, you know, program, you know, some, some administrative thing or some technical need that somebody has on a project. And so that'll oftentimes in our organization become a web development task, right? So here's our task that we're going to do. The problem is there's no, there's no overarching push. <coughs> across NASA to say, well, you, when you build your web app, you, should, you have to do it this way. Or you should do it this way. So there's no enterprise architecture, so to speak. So the data lives in that app, you know, and, and it kind of dies in that app. And, and what we're trying to do is, is build a greater architecture so that systems, and we're really actually looking at Semantic Media Wiki or some repository actually providing that kind of repository, that centralized kind of architecture. And, and being almost like the replacement for our, you know, our MySQL server that, you know, that runs on, you know, the 60 or 70 web apps we have. Right, so from top down, that's what that is. Has anybody said, ooh, I really love the way I can do something on Space DB, DB or? They're just starting to. Um, so not so much Space DB, but the internal, you know, analog to that. Um, they're starting to. They're really, oftentimes, you know, these web development tasks take forever and people give all these extra requirements and we're not using, we've, we've typically not used a lot of frameworks. So what we're trying to do is use these frameworks so you can get a lot of these functionalities almost for free, right? They just kind of, they come and they're very simple and oh yeah, I just got to turn on that extension and I get that functionality all of a sudden. As opposed to, okay, now we got to make a mapping piece, a, a full separate um, development. Um, and so it's kind of a mindset change of leveraging frameworks, uh, and, and I'm trying to get Semantic Media Wiki as a framework that we rely upon, and it's starting to catch. Just to clarify, are you saying that, are you saying users are saying, I don't really care how it's done, but I like that I can do it with this? It, it's a mixed bag. There's, there's, a, there's a bit of each. Um, I think people are, it, it, what's really pushing it is managers liking that we're getting stuff done faster. <laughs> that's, I mean, honestly, that's, if I had to boil it way down, that's, you know, that's a piece of it. I think users, we have a lot of, you know, average age at NASA is, is I think, over 50 now. Uh, 50, it used to be 47 a couple years, now it's 51. At some level, n the majority of people who work at NASA are not digital natives whatsoever, right? So they don't, th they don't li th think in terms of web, and they don't think in terms of, you know, like, how the web can, you know, connect you and share information and open things up. They don't think that way. So, I'm, I'm kind of answering another question now, but I'm, that's, what, that's, what, that's kind of the reality of it. I, I want to respect uh, the break. If you have more questions, you're welcome to, to come up uh, up front and, and ask. Well, let's give a round of applause.